Hello, and welcome back to Let's Play Pathfinder Keymaker Enhanced Edition with me, Bring It Dawn. Uh, first thing we're going to do is talk to Jubilos, then we're going to head towards the Tenebris Depths uh, for the DLC content. Uh, Jubilos raises his head and closes his notebook. Ah, oh, it's you. How can I help you? Um, you're not very friendly, you know. Do you think so? Jubilos looks at you above his glasses. Why ever not, if I may ask? Perhaps you confuse superficially friendly words with genuinely friendly intentions. Believe it or not, I wish you only well. As a proof of that, I can point to the fact that I travel with you, and that I'm talking with you right here and now. Tell me, which do you value more? An artificial smile, or an honest attitude bolstered by friendly advice and assistance? Uh, very well. You can behave as you like. Why, thank you for this permission. Can I have it in writing, in case you forget someday? Okay, uh, what are you jotting down in your, in your notebook all the time? Uh, notes on our adventures. Good ideas that come to mind. I don't know how it is with you. But in my case, my mind is constantly producing thoughts and ideas worthy of writing down. Some I use in my articles and books. Others I will share with the audience next time I speak at Foray Logos and Absalom. Uh, some, others, some other thoughts should be kept out of public view for a while. Our world isn't yet ready for certain revelations. Alright, well tell me about yourself. I've heard this request so many times. Well, as we're traveling together, I suppose I can give you an interview. Free of charge, of course. Uh, where are you from? All of Galarian is my home. I am a citizen of the world. Uh, some might say my home is Absalom, that great old patchwork city. It's there that my books and magazine articles are published, and there I am held in particularly high esteem owing to my vast knowledge. In fact, once I was invited to the College of Mysteries itself. I prefer to think of Absalom not as a home, but headquarters, where I go to plan my next adventure. I have visited every country worth mentioning in Avastan and Garund. I even trod in I've even trodden the exotic lands of Tingja. I've seen miracles you couldn't even imagine, and, it, and in every place I've been, there was a home that would have gladly received a renowned explorer such as myself. The famous name of Jubilas Narthropol is known even in the most remote corners of the world. Uh, still, where were you born? You know, the line between persistence and importunity is very thin, and you risk crossing that line. Jubilas sighs. Do you think I have... that I... Sorry. Do you think I haven't mentioned my birthplace because of my forgetfulness? I was born in Taldor, if you must know. The Empire is in decline nowadays, but still cherishes the illusion of its past glory. It's a country torn by prejudice. In Taldor, my mind was trapped in a cage of restrictions, birthright, pro poverty, and their beggars be darned attitude. If I left the country as soon as I understood it. So if you ever try to rekindle any patriotic feelings in me, you'll be disappointed. My first article in the Independence was about Taldor. The magazine was almost closed as a result of the scandal that followed, and it would have closed were it not for crowds of my supporters marching in protest under the windows of the publishing house, making its editors change their minds. Uh, you traveled so much. Uh, tell me of your travels abroad. Uh, Jubilas tilts his head, peering at you. I've written a fair number of articles and essays on my journeys, and if you'll excuse me, I haven't the slightest desire to retell them all to you right now. If you wish to learn about foreign lands, pick up any issue of the Independence and read all you like. I'm sure you can find my magazines even in this hole of a place. Uh, so you write books and magazine articles? I certainly do. I'm too generous not to share my thoughts and journeys with, with other minds who search for knowledge. Uh, judging from your face, you don't belong in that category. Chupilas size. Among my scientific works, I'd recommend the range of articles published in National Alchemy. If you prefer a lighter reading, you might like Traveler's Essays or The Scandalous Independence. If pictures capture your attention better than words, page for the illustrated Atlas of Avistan. And you should give your cook a volume or two of my culinary almanacs. Trust me, it might help. Jubilas throws a speculative glance at you. Some have tried to blame me for a sleazy romance novel called The Five Sins of Seren Ray. I have no idea on... I have no idea on who spread those these crazy rumors. But if you like such frivo frivolity... I've been informed that the novel's sequel, The Sixth Thin, was recently published. Uh, you wear glasses. Why don't you ask some cleric to heal your eyesight? Jubilas throws a cutting glance at you. I'm sure you could have figured out the answer to that question on your own if you bothered to use a logical approach. At least I sincerely hope so. I prefer to think of you as a, as of a, of you as of lazy person, not a stupid one. As of a lazy person? Uh, Jubilas tightens his lips. Well then, I suppose it's my fate to enlighten you. Alright, there's no time like the present. Let's build up to a logical conclusion together. So starting with the obvious, 
A cleric services cost several hundred gold coins. Spectacles cost a dozen gold coins. So maybe I just couldn't afford to pay the cleric. Incorrect cl conclusion. Iron enough, besides, some clerics would surely help me free of charge because they're fans of my incomparable talent. The answer can't be money then, so what is it? Let's explore further. Surely you've noticed that I'm a rather famous person. Just to be clear which circles I'm famous in, my scientific articles are well known among the students and teachers of various institutions of higher education. My articles that satirize the rich and powerful are extremely popular among the modern nobility, traders, and workers. That is, among anyone who doesn't have any power for themselves. The kind of people who don't usually have enough money to afford an expensive cleric. Well, can you add it all up and find the right answer yet? Gblast doesn't let you get a single word in edgewise. Apparently he's uninterested in your reaction, and is just enjoying listening to his own voice. My spectacles are something that unites me with my readers. People are more open to those who share their social status. Many of my readers can't afford to heal their eyesight at the temple. So when I too refuse such healing, I become closer to the people. My spectacles are part of my image. Gblast exhale, exhales at last. I believe I've managed to explain the basics of logical thinking. No need to thank me. Okay, well, I actually know, or used to know somebody that talked like that, was constantly condescending, and the best part was they were wrong most of the time. I'm not saying Jubilast is, but... Anyway, uh, tell me something about the history of the gnome race. What have I come to? Jubilast Narthropple, famous explorer, writer, and scientist, is reduced to giving simple lessons in history? Well, very well, ask away. What questions do you have? Uh, how did gnomes appear in Galarian? They came here in ancient times from the first world. Do you know what the first world is? You know, you do know what the first world is, right? If you don't, ask me about it some other time. I used to lecture on it at a couple of institutes. According to the understanding I've accumulated, the gnomes were an immortal race until some of our especially insightful ancestors came up with a brilliant idea. They decided it'd be fun to learn how it feels to be mortal. I'd like very much to meet those gnomes. I wouldn't even kick them. I'd just look in their eyes without a single word. Too bad they're all long dead by now. As everyone knows, a stupid enough idea can be extremely contagious. So the gnomes caught this infection, all of them, without a hope for a cure. Uh, so they found a way to Galarian and decided to settle here. And you'll never believe it. They got just what they wanted. They severed their link with the first world. They gained mortality, the bleaching, and a heap of local diseases that have been keeping our race on the verge of extinction ever since. Uh, do gnomes live long? Certainly. Long and happily ever after. Jubilat shakes his head in remorse. Would live as long as elves were it not for the bleaching. That's the curse of our race, which only struck after the gnomes left the first world. To put it simply, gnomes must constantly have new experiences. If a gnome gets into a rut, so to speak, he bleaches. Uh, we start to lose color, literally. Our skin and hair become pale, and the worst thing is, our, is that our soul loses color too. If the process continues unchecked, the gnome dies. History recalls only a few cases where gnomes actually died of old age. Most of them perished either because of the bleaching, or in the middle of some crazy adventure they've joined just to stave it off. So you travel so much as a way to fend off the bleaching. Jubilat stares at you, and then nods slowly. You see, I enjoy being alive. I like to eat pancakes in the morning, I like to write articles for magazines. I like it when I leave the publishing house in Absalom, and a crowd of fans immediately mobs me. So I don't intend to die at the peak of my life because of some stupid ancient curse. But don't you dare imagine that everything I do is for fear of the bleaching. I tell people the truth about the world that surrounds them. My theoretical research aids the development of different branches of science in various institutes. Yes, sooner or later I'll die and I'll bleach and die, like any other gnome. But the name of the famous Jubilas Narthropo will live throughout the ages. Alright, uh, let's change the subject. I'd like to learn more about the first world. Well, you've asked the right person. I'm an expert uh, in studying the first world. Give me your questions. Uh, the first world, what's it like? It's huge, wild, and extremely unfriendly to the unprepared traveler. Nothing remains constant there. Matter changes before your eyes. What was a mountain yesterday becomes a river today. That river flows upwards. The trees touch the sky. The heat of the desert can melt metal. And hurricane winds can tear a person apart. But it would be wrong to think the first world as the plane of total destruction. Creation is just as important there. The deserts spring alive into forests, and when the hurricane subsides, animals emerge from hiding, huge, wild, as untamed as the world itself. The first world epitomizes life in its original chaotic meaning. 
There's a theory that the gut. There's a theory that gods use the first world as a training ground to practice their ability to create matter. They then abandoned the first world to its own fate and wandered off to create Galarian. Some say that the inhabitants of the first world still hold a grudge against the gods for this. Uh, how can a person get there? Uh, mainly through magic portals created by skilled magicians, but the price of such a portal is usually in excess of several thousand gold coins. There is another way, of course. There are documented cases where spontaneous portals to the first world have opened in remote places of Galarian, where, as mages say, the boundaries between the two worlds has grown thin. But spontaneous portals are rather dangerous. You never know what's lurking on the other side. Only desperate adventurers and madmen use them, and of course, romantic suicidal idiots who think that good common sense is too boring. Are there any sentient beings in the first world? Of course, the Fae, and all their relatives, and all their relatives' relatives. And then some more fey besides. Sometimes one meets leprechauns or satyrs there, which are, which are actually another type of fey, just called by another name. All of them are immortal, by the way, at least within their own home world. The souls of the creatures of the first world have no connection to the realm of mortals. When a creature of the first world dies, its soul just materializes in another body, similar to its old one. It's not a pleasant experience, and the resurrected creature loses almost all of the powers and abilities it developed over its life, but keeps all of its memories and personality. It's still much better than a mortal death, I would say. Sometimes, the process doesn't even take long. A killer might meet his victim again the following week. Naturally, this immortality has influenced the way the First Ward inhabitants think. For instance, Fae enjoy mischief and tricks that can easily end in someone's death. The Fae think it's just funny, and anyone from another world who falls victim to such tricks doesn't end up having much to say at all. Once the gnomes were mortal, relative Once the gnomes were mortal relatives of the Fae, Jubilas sighs. Uh, who rules the first world? Uh, it's commonly assumed that the eldest rule it. They're overseers, but more just a glorified version of fey lords. Power attracts pompous blackheads in every world. Remain silent. Chiblast gives you a critical stare. It's fortunate then that this problem doesn't trouble your lands at all. Uh, but let's get back to the first world. The Eldest possess the power to keep matter in the first world in a more or less constant state. That's why the Fae treat them as demigods and offer them prayers, just as we offer prayers to Desna, Aristotle, or even Lamashtu. I know a lot about the first world. Have you ever been there? Shublast wrinkles his lips. I haven't the opportunity yet, unfortunately. My studies of the first world are limited to the confused statements of witnesses or scribbles in their diaries. I've also studied the remains of some unfortunates who periodically fall out of spontaneous portals. I keep to the hope that sooner or later I'll manage to visit that wonderful place, and certainly the notes I'd write on that place would be far more extensive and informative than all the ramblings on the subject I've had to wade through. Naturally, the main concern of my expedition would be the safety of its leader, namely me. It'd be extremely foolish to go that far and see that much, only to lose the chance to tell anyone about it. Tell me, why have you studied the first world so thoroughly? Jubilas looks at you for several moments, his eyes narrow. I told you already. I like to be alive. I assure you, other gnomes share that sa the same attitude. Between the bleaching, disease, and old age, we have a lot to yearn for. But the ancient gnomes for some reason decided that mortality, the bleaching, and all the diseases of Galarian are preferable to the immortality of the first world. I can't do anything to change that, but I can do something with my own life. I want to find a way back to the first world for all the gnomes of Galarian. Unfortunately, to do this, I can't just gather up all the gnomes and send them marching through the nearest portal. We're too attached to Galarian now. We've lost our we lost our connection with the chaos of the first world. We've become too mortal, if you see what I mean. When a gnome dies in the first world, he dies forever, like any visitor. But there must be something that can be done to solve this problem, and I intend to find out what it is. Jubilas Narthropple, the hero who returned the gnomes home, it has a nice ring to it, wouldn't you say? Okay. Talk to Jubilast. He's a little full of himself, but he's actually a good character. He's one of my, uh... Actually, I like his side quest. I think, out of all the companion quests, I think Valerie has the best one. Oh yeah, I need to check something. Someone brought up... Yeah. So when you revive, it says in the descriptor for uh, resurrecting companions that they'll have negative levels uh, that's not implemented in the game so it's not something you have to worry about when you resurrect your uh 
your companions. I am going to look for a better weapon for Amiri real quick. Uh, just a two-handed weapon of any kind, really. I could give her this, because she has the Bastard Sword proficiency. I can't afford it, so never mind. I will not give her that. Actually, I'm not going to buy anything, because I'm basically broke. Alright, um... For the depths, I think I'm going to bring this party. Valerie might be worth having. Hera might be worth having. We have a ton of buffs. Screw it, we'll do it with this, these guys. I think I'm going to switch my party around, uh, except for a couple of companions. I'm going to keep Kaisi and uh, Lindsay and probably Amiri with me at all times, but the other ones will be kind of mixed in and out depending on the quest we're doing. Um, so like for Troll Trouble, uh, Harem wants to go, Jubilost wants to go. So I'll bring both Harem and Jubilost, get rid of Tristian, put Harem in, and keep Jubilost uh, with us. Oh, it's all the way up there. One day in 19 hours. Oh boy. I mean, I guess I should check out the old Mesa on the way, right? Yeah, we'll do some exploring on the way there. My skills are getting rusty. Right, does he have... I've heard that Arcane Bomb is really potent. He does not have it. He only has the other two. That's fine. We should move. Yes. Just letting the ink dry. All right, Mary, you're gonna hold your position. Canary, you can actually heal her up a little bit. Command me. This is the wrong one. Where is the other one at? Nope, I'm sorry, do that. Alright, let's go. Alright. There you go. I use that opportunity to heal up uh, Amiri a little bit. She is exhausted, though. Come on. I'm listening. Oh, come on. I don't really want to rest here yet. Let's just keep going. Ah, sure. We'll just take it all. You know, do some exploring on the way up to the uh, the DLC. I keep forgetting that it's called the Tenebris Depths because it's uh, or Tenebris. I think it's Tenebris. There's more emphasis on the E. Uh, I'm there. That's right. She's still exhausted. Oh well. It's not a big area. I probably won't need her anyway. Oh, it's werewolf. Uh oh. All right, that could be trouble. Well, quiet. I'm thinking. Um. What you want? Yeah, come on, get it. Their life ends here. I should put blur on him sooner. Whoopsies. Oh. 
There we go. Let's cut him down. I don't think we can hurt this guy. Serves you right. At least barely. All right. Well, Pisces can. All right. That wasn't too bad. Thank goodness for Jupiter Lost, man. Whew. And Kaliki, of course, or Kalika. I have a tendency of calling her Kaliki. Oh no, I want Jathal with me for this. Son of a gun. Follow if for the uh, the deaths, because there's chests and hidden doors and stuff in there. So... Good li there. Goodbye, Jubilost, I guess. Son of a gun, I forgot about that. Well, I do think Jubilas would be good to have. Then again, I could just bring Jathal instead of Amiri. Because she can't die. Or Amiri is more likely to die. Um... Mysterious weed, and it's a problem. Take care of that for me, Tristian. Alright. Just deal with the problems as they arise. Not a big deal. Should I cut this way? I'm gonna cut this way. This is a place that I had a lot of trouble finding, I think, the last time I played through. I had, my perception check just kept failing. But yeah, I doubt we'll actually start the DLC this episode because uh, we keep running across you encounters and stuff. But Any last wishes? <laughs> hey, it's the Thormacat. Can I talk to you, young Thormacat? I do what I must. Alright, Mary's closer to this side. We should exit this way. I wish I could talk to him. Did he say anything? Clami Clavi. Yeah, Dumber Cat will help you. Okay, he did say something. Huh. Interesting. Can wait. Oh, this isn't good. Most of us are exhausted. May we have a moment of respite? No, we may not. Take we have a uh, combat ahead. Make this quick. This will hurt. There we go. One shot. Good job, Kalika. I'm not gonna grab all this stuff. I'm off. All right. We just gotta wait on Amiri again. What do you think? Do I get to it from this side? Nope. This side. Alright, I'm gonna rest before I enter because we are uh, pretty banged up. Where could I put you?
plus 9, plus 10. Yeah, you're better for that. Just to speed it up. Perhaps with divine assistance, you could be healed of your unnatural unlife. Do you really prefer to be a walking corpse? Who are you lying to, priest? Me or yourself? The only healing your goddess can offer me is a final death. All right, in we go. And I have played the beginning of this DLC. I haven't actually entered the dungeon yet, but uh, I started a campaign just to see what the DLC was all about. I was mostly curious to see what level you started at. But uh, yeah, here we are. In due time. It's a Dargan. Ah, Zerillin. Or Z Zelirin? The silver dragon stares at you for a long time, unblinking. Maybe it's just a trick of the light, but you think you can see a heavy mercury teardrop roll from its pearly eye. You've answered my call, Protective Galarian. I will have you know, no one has ever returned from these caves alive. Many valiant heroes before you have sacrificed their lives to bring victory one step closer. I have not forgotten their feats, nor I will forget yours. Uh, who are you? Tell me about yourself. Uh, what do you want to know? I'll hide nothing from you. Uh, who are you? My name is Zer Zelryan, I guess. Zelryan? I'm a loyal servant of Apsu. Oh, the maid of Tiamat. Okay. Thousands of years ago, my god appointed me to watch over this place, where deep in the depths there hides a great evil. I knew at once the repulsive smell of the beast, but it took me centuries to locate the egg that he left. All this time I've stood guard here, looking for a way to destroy the spawn before it hatched and brought immeasurable sufferings to those who dwell upon the land. Apsu, who is that? Dragon casts a pearly skyward glance. Oh, Apsu. He is more ancient than all the gods whose names you know. He is the maker of all, who stands at the origin of the multiverse. Few mortals remember him, but we metallic dragons still praise him in our prayers. Is it just me, or are you really sad? So many heroes passed here. The noblest souls of Galarian, selfless protectors of their homeland ready to sacrifice their lives to save it from the spawn of the beast. I remember each and every one, striding fearlessly down into the darkness. Almost none of them have returned, and it's all my fault. The dragon lowers its huge head. True repentance can be heard in, it, in his thunderous voice. I made a mistake, and they paid dearly for it. You see, I never understood the true nature of the monster. For many years, I and the heroes who answered my call would wander these dungeons, thinking that the monster larva was the greatest threat. It was only when I found the egg and touched its shell that I realized the spawn had turned the entire dungeon into its nest. Madness, mortal. Darkness and madness are the monster's sword and shield, its food and the material that its shell is made of. The heroes I summoned here descended into madness. They lost their minds, and the spawn of the beast fed upon their insanity. Somehow, I avoided the same fate. They went down into the darkness, driven by the noblest of intentions, and were rewarded only with eternal torment. Uh, what are you doing here? I'm guarding the spawn of Robogug that sleeps in the caves beneath us. I summon heroes to help me defeat it. It is a long and joyless vigil, but I believe that it will one day be over. Perhaps you yourself are the hero who will finally achieve this long-awaited victory. Well, thank you for the answers. The truth is the least I can give you for your feet. He keeps going on about truth, but I already don't trust him. Never trust a dragon. Uh, what feat do you expect of me? An egg laid by the abominable Robogug abominable Rivergug has cursed this dungeon for thousands of years. The larva of the beast will destroy half of the river kingdoms if it hatches. The shell that surrounds it is a labyrinth of darkness and madness, inhabited by thousands of its former victims. Hundreds of heroes perished as they sought a way through it, but now I know where the egg is, and the path to it is almost clear. Almost. What blocks the way to the monster? Oh, that is the saddest and scariest part. The spawn of the beast feeds on nightmares, and its very shell is made of madness. The caves around are filled with insanity, it has flooded them with an ocean of darkness, which distorts the very nature of the multiverse. Heroes who approach grow mad or perish in great suffering. This gives the egg its strength. The monster feeds on their terror and pain. Neither alive nor dead, 
but tormented eternally by their worst nightmares. These brave heroes still wander the labyrinth. Find and destroy four of their strongest, and the power of the beast's madness will weaken. Then I'll be able to crack open the shell. We must destroy the monster before it hatches and grows strong. The fallen priestess, the wary traveler, the wicked chanter, the captor and his horrifying slave. Deliver them into peace, and the path to the enemy will be opened. Why don't you kill these four yourself? The dragon's body shudders. It would seem that the thought of what hides in the depths can chill the soul of even a mighty dragon. Fiek is surrounded by an ever-shifting labyrinth of insanity and darkness. This insanity which the larva admits is capable of subduing even the most valiant of heroes. I have ventured down before, and it was only by a miracle that I slipped the fate that has ensnared so many other brave heroes. If I tried to vanquish it alone, then sooner or later it would devour me, drink my soul, and add me to the horde of the nightmares that guard it. Who, who would be able to destroy me then? Thus I continue summoning heroes to this place. Many of those who answered my call turn their backs and return to their lives. Once I discover how slim their chances of victory, and I do not blame them. But my vigil is nearing its end. The hour of the last battle with the monster draws near. If you can manage to weaken its shell, I can crack it, and we'll finish it together. Uh, tell me about the fallen priestess. Her name is Tioko Sakasama. She led a party of adventurers here, noblest heroes and truest friends. Together they defeat many foes, but they never face anything like this. Tioko once served Lamashtu, then this brave and wise woman recognized how disgusting her patron was, and gathered the strength to leave her service, finding shelter in the hands of Desna. Alas, Lamashtu is called the Mistress of Insanity for a reason. The labyrinth tricked Tioko's mind and stole from her Desna's protections. When next her reason failed, she returned to Lamashtu and sacrificed her friends to her cruel mistress one by one. Ever since, she has lurked into the depths, seeking new gifts for her mistress. Alas, the last embers of good in her soul have long faded. She has become a monster. The beast has consumed her utterly. Uh, tell me about the wary traveler. He was a gnome called, named Baal Zess. He was quite a famous traveler, a pathfinder in three continents. The Belgian gives no quarter to his people. There came a day when he grew tired of new roads. When he heard my call, he came, knowing it would be his final adventure. He did not anticipate victory, but hoped at least for an honorable death. Alas, the darkness reached out to him from the abom abominable spawn of the beast and refused him even that. An aura of madness filled the gnome with the delusions of grandeur and transported him to into the marvelous Fey world, where he sits, a godlike ruler. He has become a frightening, dangerous, and pathetic caricature of his former self. A king without a kingdom, the god of a rotten soul. Immersed in sweet dreams, he wanders the halls, barking orders at the wandering monsters. A sad sight to behold. His death will bring him not only peace, but also restore the dignity he's lost. Uh, tell me about the captor. Uh, the captor is the greatest wizard I have ever managed to talk into visiting this gloomy place. I had high hopes for him, and so I turned a blind eye to the darkness in his soul. I expect he was already insane before he even came here. Nothing else could explain his indifference towards suffering. But he was strong and confident, and managed to get quite close to the spawn. Very close, before he met his end. Be warned that the captor does not appear alone. He is always accompanied by a disgusting beast that he summoned from beyond the world. The two are firmly bound in death, and can revive each other, so they must both so they must both be killed at once. That's an annoying mechanic. Uh, tell me about the Wicked Chanter. She is the dungeon's greatest mystery. In the long history of my vigil here, she has but recently appeared. Heroes who set off into the depths begin to encounter something quite strange. A woman in rags who wanders the darkness, accompanied by a horde of monsters. She is known to announce her arrival in song. She sings as she hunts, and sings as she kills. The monsters of the dark serve her loyally and faithfully, protecting her to their dying breath. I know not who the Chanter is. Many brave heroines have disappeared into the dungeon, but none possess such control over monsters. I only know that the Chanter is more insane than the three other nightmares of the dungeon combined, and the terror she carries with her knows no mercy. She must be defeated. I see. The feat I ask of you is most dangerous, almost certain, certainly suicidal. If you agree, I want you to understand what you're getting into. Uh, can I rest here? Of course, my table is set for everyone. Eat and rest as much as you like. Down below in the darkness, you will have to be at your best. Well, I need supplies. Of course, but forgive me, my treasures are not endless, and I cannot provide you with free supplies. If you require the aid of a priest, select a scroll, and I will read it for you. But be careful. 
Down in the labyrinth, you're on your own. Do not go into the depths without a servant to the higher forces in your party. On a fireball would probably just be good to have in general. Flaming dart. Okay. I need to compare that to what Amiri currently has equipped. Let me see. Everybody has. I think everybody has a ring of protection of some kind except for her. Yes, I can sell that. Uh, if I have a cloak of resistance, one of magic missile. I should probably just give that to Lindsay. What else should you have? Ear piercing scream, lead blades, lesser extend meta magic rod. Uh, lead blades, not too worried about right now. I can grab Cat's Grace for uh, my main character. We're really close to leveling up. So, uh, probably after the first level or two, we should level up, according to what I've been told. And that means I'll finally get Death Strike, which means I'll actually do damage to the main character, which is like, super exciting. Alright, so we can rest here, and I do know that this right here will, uh, Dead guy there. I know that this will reset after every level, I believe. The way the dungeon works is you can. What does this say? Dalbus is covered with the names of long forgotten heroes. I'm there. And the way the dungeon works is you can keep going down, it'll take you to the next level, but whenever you go back up the stairs, it'll automatically take you back up to the top. And then I know that there's hidden stuff that requires perception checks, chests, and hidden doors and stuff in the dungeon as well. So let's talk to the honest guy, and then we'll probably call it an episode. And in the next one, we will enter in. Also, I like the music uh, for this area. A tall, bulky fellow with a shaved head studies you closely, paying special attention to your equipment. He grins. Hello, my friend. Do you, do you want to look your finest? I have the best wares and the fairest prices in all the tenebrous depths. And who are you? I'm an honest guy. The lad strikes his chest proudly with his fist. I stand here honestly, welcoming heroes, and sing them off to their feats of glory. I honestly collect the gear from their breathless corpses, and I honestly sell it to the next heroes. You freely you freely and calmly admit that you pillage corpses. Uh, forgive me my skepticism, but do you really never do that yourself? You've never taken anything from an enemy you've killed or a dead body you found? Yeah, taking the equipment from a defeated enemy is honest. He's just taking advantage of the situation without doing anything to help. Hmm, you just gave me an idea. Maybe I should be called Smart Guy, not an Honest Guy. Uh, s still, it's not very nice. We put our lives at risk for everyone else while you profit from our misfortune. Are you saying the Honest Guy isn't fair? That I have no shame? Why, do you? The plunderer nearly drops his spear in indignation. Of course I do. Maybe I get very sad every time I loot a new corpse. Maybe I'm thinking, you know, what a pity. This great hero has perished. I'll tell you what. I promise you, I'll change. I'll donate a part of my earnings to orphans, and to the Ayamade paladins for their fight against the demons, and to druids to help preserve the dwind dwindling dinosaurs. I give you my word. I'm an honest guy. No one is more honest than me. Ada Zeliran? Zeliran? Allow your pillaging? What could he have a problem with? I'm betraying no one. I attack no one. I just pick up things that belong to no one and find them new owners. Perfectly honest, isn't it? And besides, that scaly worm would be so bored without me, he never has anyone to talk to. Let's look at your wares. Oh, an adamantine chain shirt. Ooh, one of displacement would be good. Ooh, one of haste. I can afford it. Like, Wand of Haste is, oof, 
I, I love haste. It's my favorite spell. We don't have it currently, so... Welcome aboard, haste. for now. Oh yeah. Fairy Dragon's not out. That's not good. Alright, in the next episode we head into the uh, the dungeon and begin the DLC. So I know that the, the dungeon is endless, but for the main campaign I'm just going to focus on defeating the final boss. I don't know, not the final boss, but uh, the spawn of Robogug, which we uh, talked about with the dragon. I don't know if the dungeon is actually endless in the main campaign. But if you were to play just the Beneath the Stolen Lands DLC as a standalone campaign, it is endless. But uh, for I'll probably stop at the spawn of Rovagug regardless. Uh, but it, it's the dungeon is limited, uh, I think, per chapter. So like we're in chapter two, so we can only do the first few levels, and then you know chapter three we'll do the next few levels. It, it'll stop us from progressing. So anyway, uh, thanks for watching. I hope to see you guys in the next episode.